and welcome back to episode 105 of Talk of Fame podcast with their host, Kylie Lantigny, and I'm so excited to have on journalist, actor, and activist, Ju- Julia Chang. Thanks so much. Come on, Julia. Um, thank you for having me. Um, this is a common mistake people make because I think somewhere in Wikipedia or somewhere online, my name was printed as Julia, mm-hmm. but it's actually Julie. Oh, Julie, that's right. Yeah, but it's all good. It happens. Um, yeah, thanks for having me, Kylie. Of course. And so you are the creator of 940 Life. Like, how yeah. did you come up with the idea of kind of starting 940 Life? Um, gosh, that was like totally my second mountain. I had been working in TV broadcasting and morning shows for a long, long time. I want to say 16, 17 years. And I got really sick. I had a brain tumor and it sort of made me think about the span of life in a very different way. Mm -hmm. So I realized that when you have a child from the time they're born until they go to college or turn 18, you really just have 940 weeks. Mm -hmm. And I say weekends really, because weekdays we're all kind of busy working and being in the grind. And so think about how few days that is two two days out of the week for 940 weeks and it's far fewer if you think about the parents who are divorced uh it's far fewer if you think about the fact that you're 16 you don't want to hang out with your parents (laughs) you really have such a small window to connect with your kids Mm -hmm. you know infants times you can connect but you know they they also aren't reasonable their brain hasn't developed it to a point where you can really deeply connect as like a as like a family member well that I shouldn't say that nursing and all that stuff has been proven to be deeply connecting but it's just multifaceted connecting happens I think from age three until I don't know 13 14 15 and so you just have such a little window of time and so I wanted people to be very cognizant of that so mm-hmm. I came up with a YouTube series. Uh, each episode is about 10 minutes um, using different techniques in slowing down time and also different techniques to truly connect with people that matter the most in your life. Because quite frankly, we live in a busy world in a very distracting world and we've lost our way. Mm-hmm. We've lost our way. You know, if you look at the root of every tragedy on earth, whether it's school shooting to homicides, gang violence, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. At the very stem of all of that is someone who felt completely isolated Mm -hmm. and that they didn't have better options and that they didn't have the deeply rooted connections needed to feel supported and to make better decisions. And so mm-hmm. that's where 940 came from. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. And like, like you said, like a little bit ago, you were diagnosed with a brain tumor. Uh-huh. Like, like, like when you were diagnosed with, um, with a brain tumor, how do you kind of manage kind of dealing with that? Well, no one really prepares you to have a brain tumor. <laughs> that's for yeah. sure. Um, you know, I'm really lucky where I think I'm almost, optimistic to a fault and I also have incredible incredible support system and part of the reason I have an amazing support system is I have been on my own since I was 15 what happens when you start living alone at 15 is you accidentally or inadvertently develop a really keen sense of reading people's emotional IQ Mm-hmm. Or I'm, I, I should say that better. I don't know about my IQ per se, but my emotional IQ is really high. They call that EQ. Mm-hmm. And I also have a really high AQ, agility IQ. It's the way I can sort of shift and find my own grounding when things don't go my way. So that like all of those, those survival skills really prepared me well for broadcasting and also to deal with uh, setbacks like brain tumor, right? Um so I just, uh, at that time, my boyfriend, my then boyfriend, now husband, was my solid rock, um, which was great because, well, it expedited, it expedited everything in the sense we had to elope. We didn't have to, but I don't have a relationship with my mom. We're estranged. But despite that, because Leif and I were not married, I, I called her to tell her my diagnosis. And she was like, 
she suffers from mental illness. So it, please excuse her response. But her response was, why would you do this to me? I already have so many worries on my plate. Why would you add brain tumor to that? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I was actually just calling her because my big request was I would need a family member with me in the operating room. Should something go not right and I become a vegetable, a family member would have to make the call of um, pulling the plug. Mm -hmm. So I was going to call in that favor to her. And based on her response, I was like, okay, this she's not ready to support me in the way I need to be supported. So when I also got my diagnosis, I tried to break up with my boyfriend, Leif, because we were doing long distance, New York, LA. And I said, you know what? You're 33. Like, this is a lot for anybody to sign up for. Like, they're telling me I could be severely brain damaged. I could be severely handicapped post-surgery. I just think this is a lot for anyone to sign up for after a year of dating, not to mention most of that long distance. Mm -hmm. And he was like, the most decent human being. He flew to LA right away and he told me to throw a white dress in the car and we went and eloped because he realized that my insurance would not cover almost anything of a half a million dollar surgery, whereas his would cover the full thing, but we would have to be married. So mm -hmm. I always joke that we married for the most unromantic, but the most romantic reasons. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, but because I've been on my own since I was 15, I've been able to read people really fast. And I knew from the very beginning that this guy was a good human being. And here we are 10 years later. <laughs> yeah. Like he was a year later. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Like, did you like, since like you said, you're living on your own at 15 and then like you married like a guy that you only been doing dating for one year when he got a brain tumor and was going for surgery. Like, did you kind of ever type of think that you would date someone that you kind of was thinking like, oh my God, this guy I have to break up with because of long distance. Like, did you ever kind of picture yourself dating him now to this kind of day or practically? Uh, our story is so crazy because, and there's a lot of new friends joining me right now. This is, we're doing a, a podcast called um, uh, Fame. Uh, tell me the title again. Talk of Fame. Yeah. Talk of Fame, Hall of Fame, Talk of Fame. This should be easy with the lovely Kylie, who's 16 years old. And she reached out um, via DM asking me to for an interview. So that's what we're part of right now. And you guys could get a glimpse of how cute Kylie is. Hey, guys. You guys, when I was 16, I was like buying lip gloss at CVS. I was not entrepreneurial like Kylie is. So watch out for her. Um, long story short, Leif and I have been friends since we were kids. We both grew up in Ann Arbor, so I've technically known him since he was 13. <laughs> but back then, had you told me, like, this is the guy you're going to marry one day, I would have been like, no way. Yeah. We ended up going to New York. We never crossed paths while we both lived in New York for 10 years. And I started working on a project that involved Ann Arbor friends. And so about six months before I moved out to L.A., I connected with Leif for that project. And it was instant. The connection was instant. Yeah. So I think a month and a half after that lunch meeting where we reconnected after 10 plus years of not seeing each other, we moved in together. Oh my gosh. Really, don't ever do that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> As I share this story, I realize how crazy that is. And if my daughter kind of ever came to me and said like, oh, we've been dating a month and I'm going to move in with him, I would be like, over my dead body. Um, so anyway, look at all my friends. Okay, so Sunshine Girl, um, I'm blanking on your name right next. Coffee hasn't hit the bloodstream. I'm going to be taking questions from you guys towards the end of me and Kylie's conversation in like 20, 25 minutes. Actually, maybe even sooner if you guys come up with a good question. So send mm -hmm. them my way, okay? All yeah. right. Keep on talking, Kylie, over there in Pennsylvania. Is this snowing there? Yeah, it's currently snowing where I am, yeah. Past. And was, and I'm like not too happy. I literally hate. I mean, I don't mind snow. I just hate the cold. That's the worst part. I love your Pennsylvania accent. Are you in Pittsburgh? No, I'm from Scranton. It's two hours um uh, outside of Philly. Yeah, but I hear your Philly di or Pennsylvania dialect. It's cute. Uh -huh. No one has said that to me before. I really appreciate that. That's totally. you're the first person to ever said that to me. Actually, all right. Keep on shooting those questions. 
And so um, where, like, where are some ways people can make kind of life easier if they are dealing with like a brain tumor or just kind of dealing with any cancer that they're kind of dealing currently? Wow, that is a really hard question. Um, or like, what are some ways like things like no, that I, I do like honestly, when when you get a brain tumor diagnosis, they don't tell you that it's cancer or it's benign. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they don't know until they get to the tumor and do a, a biopsy, right? Yeah, it's not going to open up your brain twice to get to the tumor. They can only say things like it's behaving benign or it's behaving malignant but these are all like guesses right Mm -hmm. and so you quickly realize oh of all the surgeries out there this is probably one of the most major ones right because your control center without Mm -hmm. functioning properly like you Mm -hmm. should and so you start to really have your coming of jesus moment about life and death and what does this all mean and at the time, you know, I was, I was an entertainment anchor in the Mecca of entertainment, Los mm-hmm. Angeles on mm-hmm. a morning show that has a long history of being iconic, right? So yeah. Mark Fox morning show called Good Day LA. And I was like in my hospital bed, like a week in the ICU. And I just remember thinking like, like days before the big operation, I kept thinking, is there someone like famous that I wish I would have interviewed that I hadn't yet? Is there something on TV that I wish I would have featured that I hadn't yet? Like none of those thoughts ever even came to mind. Like none of that mattered. I was like, nobody cares who I interviewed. Nobody cares. I got to go backstage with Barbara Streisand and prepare for a concert or I don't know, shadow Jennifer Lopez for a day. Like nobody cares. When you are sitting in that bed, what you are thinking of is Mm -hmm. if I croak tomorrow, was I a good human being? Was I a good sister, daughter, wife, girlfriend? You know, Mm -hmm. to think about all the things relationally, because that is what lives on even when you die. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so, um, yeah, so it was really a profound sense and like it made me really realize like the things that matter and the things that don't matter, like true stock of your life. Mm-hmm. And so like you said like you like do broadcasting and all those things, like how did you kind of first start out your career in broadcasting? Oh my God, I trespassed to get my first startup. <laughs> Again, don't do this. Don't move in with a guy after a month of dating and don't trespass into a TV station. Um, this interview is not going the way I thought it would go. I'm supposed to be like somewhat of a role model. Look at me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so I was an economics major at University of Michigan. I, you know, growing up in an immigrant family um, household, I was always told you need to be a doctor, you need to be a lawyer, you need to be a business person. Because you, you know, the overall end goal is you have to be financially well. Mm -hmm. Because we did not move from Korea to the U.S. for you to be worse off than we are. You know what I mean? Yeah. Pressure always there to pick a career path that was always going to be financially driven. Mm -hmm. And so when I told my parents I want to be a TV journalist, I'll never forget it. They were like, why would you do this to us? They were like, why would you do this to us? We we have brought you to America, invested in your future, and now you want to throw it all away by going into a profession that makes almost no money and puts you in dangerous situations. Mm-hmm. And, I, and to be honest, I think my true calling was always acting. But because aspiring actor doesn't sound as good as a journalist... I sort of like chickened out and thought, okay, the way to like sort of ease into the space with my parents is to at least become a journalist because sure, they might not make a lot, but at least you get the social cachet, right? Yeah. So I, I called every single TV station in the Detroit area because I was going to school in Ann Arbor, which is 40 miles away. And I said, um, you know, I'm an econ major. I know you only give internships to communication or journalism majors, but I'm like, this is the field I really want to go into. I'm 
cold calling like a receptionist at a TV station. I guess this is like pre-internet days. So this is what people did. Yeah. Um, And all of them would be like, you're crazy and hang up and just, you know, 28 days I consecutively called because I was like, one of these receptionists will be able to be like, I was that girl one time. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, this um, Valerie, a receptionist at Fox Detroit, said to me, you know what? You sound like a really nice gal. You have called me every day and you just, you sound smart. You're at Michigan, so you can't be dumb. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I could potentially get fired for this, but could you come in on a Friday? I will let you into the premise and you can just try to like meet whoever you can, but don't mention my name and we'll go from there. So like in the most ill-fitting black suit, like mismatch that I could pull out of my sister's closets, I showed up to Detroit Fox, met the news director, who's like the boss, um, and told him why I want to go into the space, um, which was, I just felt like I had gone on semester at sea. I don't know if you've heard of Oh yeah, I know what that is, yeah. That was a trip that changed me, transformed me in wanting to be a storyteller and people connector versus completely like, I don't know, be an investment banker and make money. Mm -hmm. I, I just came back from that trip. You know, once you visit India and once you visit Africa, like you are forever a changed person. Mm -hmm. I remember coming back thinking, gosh, like when you turn on the faucet in most countries around the world, you might not get water. (laughs) Yeah, it's not a guarantee. Like mm-hmm. in India, in Africa, a lot of the faucets I turned on were empty because water is such a privilege. Yeah, and I remember coming back and never kind of using water the same and being really conscious about energy saving. And I thought to myself, "Gosh, I I wish my friends who are so wasteful could have." And I didn't blame them because they didn't have these experiences, right? Yeah. I was like, I wish they had seen these experiences so that they could also alter their behavior. Yeah. And, and I started thinking like, well, there are, there are ways to vicariously take people places. Mm -hmm. Oh, there are vicarious ways for people to meet all different walks of life type people. And it was television. So that's, that was my story that I gave to the news director when I trespassed into the uh, the office on a Friday. (laughs) And he said, you know what? We could use people like you. And he hired me on the spot. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. As an intern. As an intern. Yeah. Yeah. Like, were you like, what did you intern? Like, did you do all things at the as a at the Um, station? You know what? I this is my best piece of advice for young people. Do the work that nobody wants to do. So we had 30 interns or so at Detroit Fox, and I was the only intern willing to do the overnight shift. Detroit is a high crime city and sure, sure, it's unsafe for a young person to drive all the way from campus to Detroit in the middle of the night, Mm -hmm. but it's the chance and risk I was willing to take because I was like, oh, the overnight shift is actually when they get, let you do and try all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Like there was an arson fire. They would send me out with a microphone and a photographer. And they would say, go get sound bites. That would never happen during the day because all the reporters are there. Yeah. Right? And so I really got to get my hands dirty in the overnight shift. And that work ethic stayed with the news director because he eventually down the road helped me get my job in New York. Mm-hmm. He remembered that I was the intern willing to do the things that no other intern wanted to do. Mm-hmm. To go the extra mile. Yeah. And so, like, you were an entertainment anchor for Good Day LA, as you mentioned before, besides working in New York as well. Like, while working for Good Day LA, what did a day in your life kind of look like for you as an anchor? Uh, I would say about more or less for 16 years, I woke up between the hours of 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. Oof. Yeah. And it's not like a slow roll out of bed. Mm -hmm. You're up hair, makeup, making sense when you talk because you're going to go on TV and yeah. talk to thousands of people. Yeah. 
Um, and then it got really tricky. I mean, so I mean, it, it's really hard to say this because they they can't draw direct scientific ties. But I do really believe in my core that my brain tumor came from lack of sleep for so many years. Mm -hmm. I didn't sleep. I was sleepwalking for 17 years. You know, mm -hmm. um, I thought I could defy sleep because I was in my 20s and I was working in New York City and it was a dream come true and I was high income earner. And, and so I would just nap middle of the day, two, three hours. And I would go out to dinner at 10 p.m. because that's what people do in New York. Mm -hmm. And then I pulled into work straight from dinner at 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. Full day of work. And I did that for years. And then here in LA, I would go into work anywhere between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. But then a lot of the things I covered were happening at night. So like the Oscars, I'm out there till midnight, come home, shower, two hours later, I go back to work and be like rise and shine for a morning show. Yeah. And I do that like a good three months where it's award season, that turner over. Mm -hmm. And then there's plenty of other events that just happened at night because that's when entertainment world sort of comes alive. Yeah. For an entertainment reporter on a morning show, guess what? Your day's going to suck because you're going to have to split your life where you go out to cover these entertainment things at night and then cover it for the morning. Yeah. Turn it around for the morning. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know, I, I posted about this other day on my Instagram. People are like, what do you mean you don't remember interviewing Mariah Carey and Nicki Minaj? I don't remember. I could not tell you what we talked about, even though I probably interviewed both of them a good dozen times because I was sleepwalking the entire time. Mm -hmm. So what a shame, right? It's like, yeah. this is a job that a lot of people want. This is a job a lot of people would do for free. Uh, and here I was, I had the job. I got a high income and like at the end of the day, it really um, took a toll on my health and I don't remember half of it. <laughs> I, I would say more than 75% of it. I don't remember. If it wasn't Google pictures that reminds me that like five years ago today, this was happening. I would never believe that I interviewed or did these things. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, there's no recollection whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like, like to me, I'm like, did, like I can't even remember what I did or have for breakfast this morning. Like, I can't yeah. even remember those type of things. Yeah, but like during like that's why sleep is so important. Like sleep, sleep and I sleep, and my favorite thing is to sleep. I sleep all my free time. I on my breaks during school, I'd be sleeping on like for two hours and wake up from my last class of the day. Like this sleep is so important. But at the end of the day, like you gotta work as well. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, that's, that's a societal problem, right? Because mm -hmm. we glamorize the grind. We, we constantly feed people messages like you, you have to work a hundred hours a week to get to X, Y, Z. And, 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 and in a guilty sense, I, I had the same sort of message about my internship, right? I took mm -hmm. the night shift that no one was willing to take. That's me subscribing to the grind culture. And look where it got me. It got me a giant fist-sized brain tumor. Mm -hmm. And I'm lucky enough to live and tell about it. And that's why I'm so preachy about it. Because I'm like, please don't give yourself a brain tumor that like could be malignant to learn this lesson that I'm learning. Do you know what I mean? And here's why it's so twisted. Because so after I had the brain tumor, it wasn't like, oh my God, I've abused my body and it manifested this giant tumor and I should quit my job and, and alter my lifestyle. No, I did that job and shift for five more years after the brain tumor. Mm -hmm. Like I still hadn't learned. I still was unwilling to let go of that unhealthy way of functioning. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. It's a, it's a really tough one. Mm -hmm. And so you have been recognized for your work with a New York City Associated Press Award and a 2007 Emmy nom nomination. Like, how did you kind of feel on being nominated and basically winning the awards? I have been nominated for an Emmy, I think twice. I don't even like update my bios. I do feel proud about the AP awards because I, I feel like the AP Associated Press is very much like the BCC of, you know, the UK here. Mm -hmm. It's like 
through serious news organization. Um, I, I, you know what, if you had asked me this question pre brain tumor, I would be like, Oh, it's so amazing to be acknowledged. But, but post brain tumor, I'm like, none of that matters. Mm -hmm. You are on your deathbed. Nobody remembers how many awards you won. Like nobody cares. You don't care. You're honestly thinking to yourself, like, did I, did I make the people I love in my life feel loved back, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and then also, I mean, I, I hate saying this publicly because, <laughs> but I'm going to say it. So the Emmy process is like all a sham. So like as a member of SAG-AFTRA or like as, as like an Emmy, like they look for journalists to come into their office in person and vote on the work. Really? Yeah. And they, I think, I think they hand select the work that they like. And then out of the, the five or six that you are expected to like vote on a certain category, like best sports reporting or best feature reporting, best entertainment reporting, best, you know, serious investigation reporting, like those categories. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, like, I want to see how this works. I showed up. It was me and three 80 year olds who wanted a free lunch. So in, in order to entice you to come in to vote, they have to offer like a pizza or something. Because think about it, like everyone is busy working and doing their thing. For you to take a whole day out to go and vote for the local Emmys. So like, no. And so we voted on, oftentimes what happens is you vote on a different city's market. So we looked at a uh, piece of uh, news pieces that were done in, I want to say Houston. And like these journalists in Houston broke their backs to tell the most amazing stories. And it comes down to me and three 80 year olds who want free pizza to vote on which one of the works is the best. Oh my God. And I was just thinking, and, and then there are certainly days where honestly, one person shows up for lunch. And that person gets to decide who is going to win an Emmy for that category. It's, it's, it's a banana system. So you can't put too much weight on it. Cause you're like, Oh, this voting system is real wacky. Mm -hmm. and I was like, that's absolutely insane. I never even knew that that actually ha like happens. I mean, maybe they changed it since I went to a voting thing, but I mean, I would think now like, ugh, pandemic world like they would offer you to watch it online and and vote online and not have to show up in person yeah even then right even mm -hmm. then are you trusting that people are giving every single news piece a fair chance like someone might literally just have 10 minutes to sit down and look through the pieces and vote right mm -hmm. or their friend submitted a thing so they didn't even look through the other pieces of work they just saw their friend's name and voted mm -hmm. it's you know it's like any, any award show. It's, it's very biased and, but you know, it, it doesn't hurt to be nominated for an Emmy, but I, I don't put too much weight that that is truly my worth. Yeah. And so you have a YouTube channel called Truly Julia Chang. Like what made you? Yeah. yeah. No Julia. Oh, Julia. <laughs> oh my God. This, that always been to Julia. Julia. It's two I know. Like what made you come up with the idea of starting a YouTube channel and, and do what, you know, what do you people, what do you want people to kind of learn from that? Um, you know, YouTube is one of these formats where I think I can be the most me. A, you don't have all these crazy filters and shenanigans to make yourself look like Kim Kardashian. Like you're, for the most part, when you're putting video up on YouTube, this is like you unfiltered. Mm -hmm. also can you really tell a good story or be yourself with 15 seconds 30 seconds youtube is a format that allows you to sort of let let it breathe right mm -hmm. um yeah it is kind of funny because i'm like i think of people with youtube channels being like 12 years old and at my ripe old age i'm like at twice am i like trying to be a youtube star at my age this is so crazy <laughs> but i think um i don't know and also um i think when you look at career wise 
YouTube is like the major leagues. Like people mm. who make an income off of YouTube is is not even comparable to the Instagram stars. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's somewhat monetarily driven as well. But uh, yeah, so it's two things. I think it's it's a, it's a format that I think I respect because it's a little more real. It's a little less edited and quick and, you know, mm -hmm. and then, and then two, so it's like a form that I'm oops, super, sorry, sorry, friends that I'm super trained on. Right. Like I'm mm -hmm. in the new space and I feel like YouTube is, I don't know. So, and then also the fact that it's considered sort of the major leagues versus the minor leagues. Mm -hmm. And so the final question I have for you is what is some advice for people that are just kind of starting out as a journalist? I kind of want to make it into the journalism field. Yeah. So it's kind of building upon the advice I gave earlier. It's like, do the work that nobody wants to do because it's true work. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I know. I, when I was a newscaster, I, we would get like dozens of interns, you know, come through the doors and I always knew which one was going to make it. And I always knew day one, I knew which one was going to make it and which one is it. Mm -hmm. Because the ones that aren't going to make it, you know what they do? They plop down at their desk and they scroll. The ones that make it come to me and say, hey, uh, I know you're extremely busy, but is there anything I can take off your plate? Mm -hmm. Do you need me to file anything? Do you want me to make beat calls? Beat calls are like you call the cops or you call the fire department and see if there's anything news breaking. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's mind numbing, but it's work. And if someone comes in that's eager and hungry and and diligent and they, they volunteer to do the stuff that isn't great about the work, like that person is going to remember and be like, this kid, he's going places or she's going places. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. So I guess that's just, you know, we, I think your generation has a tough, right? Cause you, you are growing up in the, in the age of Instagram and YouTube and you see people that become instantly famous or at least it appears that way. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's tempting. And it's also very toxic in the sense you get frustrated if you don't reach that kind of notoriety right away, like some of these other, um, social media stars, right? Mm -hmm. But like, just try to live your real life. And I say this as an, a, like a content creator, which is an oxymoron, but live your life off of Instagram and YouTube and all those things and like dial into your real life and then do more doing and less streaming. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Like, like people usually depend on their life on a phone or on a social media page. And, you, yeah. and people always think like, oh my God, I wish I had their life, but not everyone's as perfect well, as they do see. And you're smart to be booking these interviews. Like you're 16 years old. Like I can already tell based on the fact that you were gutsy enough to reach out to me as perfect stranger for an interview, I can already tell you're like a go-getter and I'm going to mm -hmm. remember, right? Mm -hmm. And so more stuff like that, you're like on the track. So I'm not worried about you. I will say though, if you are going to scroll, make it work for you. Mm -hmm. Use that space and that time that you're never going to get back to build something on these social media platforms, build mm -hmm. a community, but don't, don't strictly be on there to like compare yourself or, you know, do popularity contests with friends, like be a business minded person on it and think, okay, I'm 16 years old. What can I do on here that no one else can? as Kylie mm -hmm. and and then build if that's where that if that's the space you want to grow you know um do it that way but just stay focused and don't get distracted by just the absent-minded scrolling mm -hmm. and listen, I preach what I need to hear the most so this is this is me just preaching to myself that I should do less absent-minded scrolling and more focused business building on social media exactly and so I just want to thank you so much for taking the time and 